Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of Gallery Assistance. My name is Luke and on today's episode we will be touching on our current show, Time After Time. This show brings together six artists that exhibited site-specific work during the gallery's 30 years at the Highfield campus and it's curated by the previous gallery director, Professor Stephen Foster. Within the show we have Hamad Butt, John Latham, Caroline Bergval, Charlotte Poznanska, Victor Bergin and Walter Van Rijn. It's a very interesting collection of work. Um, there's definitely a lot on display and real variety in what the artists are trying to show you. Uh, and what the, what the show actually aims to do is bridge the gap between the previous gallery space and our new location here in Guildhall Square. So really worth coming down and having a look to see what we've got to show you guys. So now, joining me today, I've got a few familiar voices and one new one. <laughs> yes. um, if you'd like to go around and introduce yourselves, everyone. Uh, yes, hello, my name's Sarah Macario. Uh, I'm David Baker. I'm Piers Inkpen. And I'm Dave Hubble. And I'm Luke. That's great. Hi, um, Luke. Hey. Hello. Um, said that last so, we've come a long way since Richter. Um, the work on display is very different, I would say. Some of it, mm. personally, I'm gelling with, not gelling with, but that's the nature of art, I guess. Yeah. Um, I actually came to David, in particular, this time to come up with some topics or questions that I thought would be interesting for us to discuss. Uh, and this episode, more so than the previous one, is going to be a bit more free-flowing, just because I think the idea of this podcast was to just have a conversation. It's not a scripted thing or anything like that. And I, I think that that was the best method for us to just have a discussion. Uh, so, first off... Um, we're going to be talking about concept versus what there is. Uh, I've spoke to a few people that we work with. Um, and for me, personally, from the background that I've had, in terms of dealing with conceptual art, I, I do struggle. Mm. I don't know about everyone else. Uh, I struggle personally just because maybe it's something that I'm not used to. So the unfamiliarity is a disadvantage for me. Um, but it's I've noticed now that it's conceptual art is more so the idea and then what we see is just their means of expressing that concept uh, and it's whether or not that, that is successful or not um, we've got a few artists on display six that I've already mentioned uh, but yeah I just wanted to see where you guys stand in terms of how you see that that challenge of concept versus execution yeah I think it's difficult being in a gallery for visual art and I think I think in a gallery generally having conceptual art because the public is coming in and they the way that you're generally attracted to something in a, in a gallery is because you see it um, <laughs> so what you're asking of the people coming into the gallery is that they read the wall text look at the work and really ponder the work really uh, think about the work because what the work has to say is not necessarily included in what's there. Um, so I, I think that instantly makes it difficult because the kind of content of the work is <laughs> kind of meant to be in your head, but you're, I don't know, it's, it, it's also what you bring to it. And I think that it's very easy for people to just walk past conceptual work because they don't see anything attractive in it mm. yeah I think there is this sort of mm, I, I kind of get what you're saying and I think um, a lot of people would say that conceptual art it, there is this challenge and do you have to kind of be an artist to understand it a little bit um, and you do you need to know all this extra information before you can appreciate the artwork. Mm. Um, and I don't really, I don't know the answers. I can see both sides of it. I can see that if you went in the room and just saw one of these pieces, for example, um, let's go with the Posenensky, um cardboard shapes, um, cube-like structures or that look like pieces from an air conditioning unit rendered in cardboard with plastic clippings to attach or 
uh, attachments, you might you might wonder what's this about? Why is it here? Um, mm. Is how is this art? Mm. Yeah, because your head doesn't instantly go to. So the the concept behind the Poznansk is that it uh, kind of simulates uh, industrial looking objects because she wanted an art that could just be made very quickly and could be sold for the price that it cost to make the art and she wanted art to almost be like a mass manufactured thing um, but you don't really necessarily get that when you just see it no but do you I mean if you kind of s sort of look at it also, I think you have to take, I've said this before, that you have to think about the context when the work was made. Yeah. Which also, again, might be difficult for somebody who yeah. isn't of an art, art background. But that was made when the, uh, the men in the room, if you like, were making um, shiny industrial uh, pieces from steel and other... Um, Kind of well, mod modernist works modern, and yes. stuff like the Banhaus Min was happening. Minimalism, I'm talking about, with mm. Donald Judd and um, okay. Robert Morris and those kinds of artists. And it's kind of a, a response to that. I see that that, mm. that work has a response to what the, the other artists of the era were doing as well. And that's quite often something I think you have to consider. So, I mean, <clears throat> with that in mind, is there an is there you know is it a reasonable thought that maybe there are simply you know levels of how much you get out of it? If you come in unprimed, going oh gallery, I wander in. You go upstairs, you see Poznanska's work, and you go hmm. You read the wall text, um, and you go okay, industrial forms, mass production. There I see them. They are cardboard. Fine. On that level, it's not difficult particularly mm. I don't think it's kind of there for you it's arrayed in the room in front of you you can look at it and go industrial form wall text fine if you happen to know or choose yeah. to later to google you know her influences and her context maybe you can choose to understand it more I'd never heard of her before mm. you know this no. exhibition yeah. I've gone and read her manifesto because I wanted to know what it said yes so that's in that sense I'm no different from any other person walking by mm. it's um, I suppose it, except that I can, you know, somebody said, oh, she wrote a manifesto, and, mm. you know, so I knew to Google it, but there's no, you know... You don't need I had no to more, know... I had no more basic knowledge than anyone else, I think. I guess, um, um, I guess maybe the thing there is that it's not that they're... Um, it's not that there isn't enough, but it's that we want more. As in, we kind of want more, like, meaning to the work, or... Okay. Some more triggers in the work, um, well, or more that the work can give us. So as in, okay, yeah. So maybe I know where the Poznanska fits into uh, modernism, minimalism, mm. uh, the kind of movements of art. Um, but even with all of that contextual knowledge, when you're looking at the work, it's still uh, an arrangement of industrial shapes. Mm and that maybe there's still, you, you want more in terms of meaning and content. Yeah, because I don't know if it was, I think it might have been one of you, but I know I was talking with Nikki about it. Um, the work for me that I enjoy the most is Hammered Butt, which is in Gallery mm, 1. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if to some degree that is because we're exposed to the entire body of work, whereas everyone else it's more of a segment of the whole body if that makes sense so I think to some degree I get more of an answer about what the concept is mm -hmm. because I have more clues more there's, yeah like you said there's more clues and triggers and, to and what it should be about link those works together and, yeah. and notice that there's something um, in you know in, in each one that links up and it bridges them all yeah Mm. But with with the Poznanska, the, um, it, when it was originally shown, you're saying mm. it was not just that those two pieces that we have in the gallery at the moment. There were other elements which I think 
were more um, more metallic pieces. And, yeah, um, but I think it, even just having, even if it was just the cardboard, I think even just having more of it, maybe there just needs to be more yeah. substance. I think maybe even if it's just for the audience at least to latch on to. Because mm. a lot of people that do come in, they don't read straight away. No. Some people do, that's fine. But some people just come in, they want to look at it, make their own assumptions, and then find out what the artist is is intending to do with the work but having only a, f a fragment of that I think can but more material was on show yeah so with the with the butt in gallery one uh, you've got three pieces to compare whereas with the Pazanenska you've only got well I'd say essentially one even though mm. there's two yeah. the main elements, objects there yeah. but um, yeah it's, well, it's I guess it's like reading a text you could you could read one page, or you could, or like one chapter, um, and dismiss, say, several others. And if you read the, the others, you well, will accrue a, a greater amount of knowledge than just one chapter. Mm. So, mm. Like we've got just the abstract of a paper. Yeah, there, yeah, very much which so. Which might indicate whether you might be interested to dig further, but maybe no more than that. Yeah, mm. possibly. Because that's the other thing. Is that Hannah Butts is great because there's more content there as well as in there's things to go into with the the um, chlorine there are the symbols of the um, Newton's cradle um, there are other things like the sublimation mm. and the Jacob's ladder but it's also gallery one is a larger gallery and yeah. accompanying the work is notes and uh, archives mm -hmm. regarding yeah. the work That's whereas true. the others yeah. don't have that although of course Walters is an archive or is a catalogue, but it doesn't, I don't know if you can get a vast array of information apart from what is on offer as this happened, for example, instead of here is, it's not, um, how would I say, it's not rhizomic in the sense where you would move from one node to the other and then uh, acquire information, it's just... What's a node? And, and like a node, yeah. As in, so oh, sure. um, I'm I'm sort of thinking in terms of the internet, where if you're on Wikipedia, if you ever play that game where you click on a link and then yeah. move to another link, <laughs> oh, and then yeah, move yeah, to yeah, another yeah. link, yeah. yeah no, you can actually so do it's that yeah. Last first shift here. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, we weren't skiving off work and doing yeah, yeah, that never happened. But whether Walters has that quality or not, um, I can't be sure for definite. But it is a catalogue primarily and not a, like a chain of signifiers. You run out, it's from mm. a, a there finite is a day, database, you'll bump into the edge, whatever you do. Yeah. Mm. There will be a point, and you, I mean, he'd been through all of it, so, you, you know, realistically one person could just go through the whole lot, mm. as he did. Mm. Um, and you've got the kind of blob graphs that generate, and they're readable mm. with meaning, and you've got the bar charts, which are not. Mm. Um, yeah. They're, vi they're, they're visual outputs of a somewhat opaque data crunching process. Um, yeah, for those for those listening, we're kind of assuming that you've seen the show. Yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> the Walter Van Ryn work is um, he's formed a big catalogue of every work that's ever been on display at John Hansard Gallery, and has kind of collated the different data from these works in terms of date and. Uh, I think T titles of the yeah, work, yeah, gallery artists. attendance, period um, between when the work was made and when it was shown. Yeah, and, and the work that is exhibited in this show uh, is kind of a lot of graphs um, of this work, and then there's four um, TV TVs mm -hmm. showing graphs. And, and kind of looping titles. The, the titles of the work that have gone in the gallery before. So, um, and yeah, so that's difficult in itself, really, because it's kind of random, really. It's Pretty much. What are the functions random. of the graphs, exactly? Does anybody know? There aren't. Because I don't, yeah, ah, okay. I don't think there is, because it's just a graph, but there's no information on the axes. Because um, mm. the, the, the database which you would access via the Mac seems to have a function, whereas everything outside of that, uh, I find the function is missing or is obscured. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly find it more impenetrable yeah. than the, the Mac piece of work. 
It's Bi- interesting you say yeah. that though, because um, I had another person complaining about that with the Poznanska. Oh right. This guy came in, and uh, he was just looking at the cardboard, and he was like, "Well, this wouldn't work." And he was talking about. He was just like, "Well, oh, this wouldn't a, work." As like a <laughs> because he was talking air conditioning unit. Yeah. So the Poznanska, <laughs> yeah, of course. The Poznanska is. Um, they get wet for a start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the shapes are like um, in the essentially air conditioning units. Um, and I was kind of like, "Well, sir, are you a um, are you a air conditioning expert engineer. then and he was just like no I just do so I do I'm an engineer and the airflow he was talking about how the shapes that are used um, where some of the um, vents sort of decline and go into each other and the spaces I, I don't really yeah, know but, but like he was saying that um, it wouldn't work because you would have to have a vent on a certain end <laughs> oh and, I see yeah. and then he was like <laughs> Well, she's clearly never worked in the industry, has she? And um, it was it was a really funny moment because I was just thinking, well, this isn't a this isn't a functional object. But we're anyway. also talking about practical functions because we can yeah. all assume an art object will have a function in terms of art. Yeah. However, a practical function, perhaps not like hammered butts uh, cradle. Well, actually, in itself, doesn't have a function because it cannot function as a Newton's cradle, but also mm. outside of art, I wonder how it, it, it doesn't function. Um, whereas, I, I don't know, if there, is there a piece of work anyone can name that does have a practical function and is also a piece of artwork? Ooh. I'm pretty sure there is one. Already made? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Although, but, are, but like, then yeah, they're like functions a are debunked, yeah, aren't Duchamp, they? Like yeah, Duchamp, yeah, Duchamp's took, coat rack or yeah. wine, wine bottle rack. Yeah. Do you think he still used it? Took it home no. and like, stored all his <laughs> bottles. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. 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 The urinal isn't because it's not plumbed in. No, yeah. no, of whoever, course, of course not. No. Whoever owns it has yeah. probably the most expensive wine rack. In the world, <laughs> Ever, yeah. Um, um, yeah. It's interesting because I think that's where. You, you have to, you do have to toss aside practical function, yeah. Mm. But then we also it it's interesting. Do we consider how functional um, artworks are, perhaps in terms of what they reveal to us, what they um, how they can make us feel, or how they can what what the triggers are that are there um, for us to read? Because you could. I mean, back going back to text, mm-hmm. could one text be more fun? One one text can be more functional than another if it's an instructive text. Mm. Well, no, but, but that's a bit too assumptive as well because. But I guess I guess cooking is quite direct, isn't it? You pick yeah. up a cookbook and that's a piece of text to tell you how to cook a bake or tart. Yeah. Um, but then there's theoretical books. But, but why well, do I you don't want know. the work to be functional anyway? Do you know what I think? Um, from hearing David talk. Perhaps Walter's work that is on the Mac that actually contains the archive yeah. is itself very practical. Right. And I already see an innate practicality to it. Yes. And I'm then comparing that with the work outside of it. Right, because it's a body of work. That's and, the thing. So and I, the I'm starting point was the John Hansard Gallery, because it doesn't have a collection. No. It doesn't have an, an archive as such, a physical archive. So it has. So he went about making a, a, a database which is mm. the archive with all this information that we've just discussed. So that was the starting point for the body of work ah. which surrounds, which we now see in the gallery. And um, in, in there, there is, we, we already discussed the TV screens with the graphs. Mm. There is a wallpaper which um, appears to be stripes, stripe, very thin stripes. But when you look very closely, it's actually... It's dates, isn't it? It's date, dates and titles. Yeah. It's dates yeah. and titles. So it's data from the database that he created, the archive. So that is, in a way, that's understandable as kind of there's a way in there because when you first see it, it looks just like pretty stripy wallpaper. And some people will walk in that gallery and walk past it and just assume that's what it is. Mm which is quite interesting because actually that isn't just what it is. No. 
Mm. And then there's this question again about <laughs> the other point I just would like to make mm -hmm. is about do you have to be an expert in something to make a piece of art about that subject or that? Um, and we were talking a little bit about that because um, your point about the <laughs> the cardboard not being you know it, it, it didn't work. Mm. That's that's really a, a lot of artists play around with ideas that they don't. They're only amateurs, uh, yeah. even if that uh, about that subject. Yeah, so I, I say, yeah, you don't you don't have to be an expert to do. Um, like Charlotte wouldn't have to be an expert in ventilation to because because that's completely the wrong context. She's actually making a work about. Uh, the sculptural, the forms, mm -hmm. or the three-dimensional forms mm. of ventilation. So it, it doesn't actually have to be practical. I, th but back back to this question of um, can art be functional? Can art? Uh, one thing I'd like to put out is can art be more functional in getting people to engage with it, and maybe how would it do that? More functional than it currently is. Or yeah. Okay. Do you mean engagement physically? Just in in terms of grabbing your attention. Perhaps okay. this goes back to your uh, requirement for signifiers or something in the work that can um, spark or yeah, influence more, you. Because at least more triggers that will make you think. Because Dave Dave went away and researched. Some people may come to Pesaneska's work, find it impenetrable, and leave it at that. So I think it depends on how curious you are and how yeah. you treat the mm. work yeah I mean curio I mean triggering people's curiosity I would have thought is a win mm. um, I don't see it any different to a science museum in that mm. you know you can go and you can see the wonderful fossils and coo yeah. over them mm. um, but you can equally go and google pteranodon or whatever and find out more and find out all oh, those other pterosaurs or someone really quite weird and yeah, walking yeah. their elbows and all this you know <laughs> with giant beaks but and all this stuff that I have googled but again this <laughs> this isn't nature these are made things but then again but there's still things which are static in front of us on the whole an artwork or an artifact from prehistory you know if you've got a trilobite in front of you mm. you can look at the trilobite in to whatever you know, detail on your hand lens if they've given you one which they might in a museum. But it doesn't do anything beyond that until you choose to dig further. See, that's another Plus point. whatever interpretation, wall text or whatever. But you, you say that, but then obviously <coughs> take children into a natural history yeah. museum, they'll go, oh my gosh, this big... Other things are more eye-catching than others. Yeah, they will. And same in an art gallery, mm. I would guess. Lot, you know... Um, Lots of kids seem to get quite excited in mm. Gallery One, and we go as they run around <laughs> yeah. the, the cradle. But it's big, it's visual and intriguing, just in and of itself. And yeah. it, it it does generate excitement in a way that mm. I'm thinking small children are probably not going to mm. get out of Walter's work. Mm. Um, yeah, I think also another really uh, good um, feature of Hamad's is just for the. Uh, the light, the sublimation mm -hmm. unit, the fact that something is changing mm -hmm. throughout that space, always. But mm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm almost like a moth. Oh my gosh! I'm a, I don't know. <laughs> moths, <laughs> moths are so on my mind because there's some stupid meme going around <laughs> about moths at the moment. But in terms of watching, watching the red light going up, I think for some reason I I do actually find that quite eye catching. Mm. But I, en I enjoy that because it does something, and like with the, what, what, it, it's just a work that yeah. actually does. It may not have a. Oh, so that's just so Jacob's the Jacob's ladder, uh, in what in Hammer's work is the sublimation unit. Oh, sorry, the su substance sublimation, sublimation unit, unit yeah. is basically a big ladder, and each rung on the ladder is a glass uh, fixture. It's a lighting fixture, and it's a. Uh, What's the red light? <laughs> it contains iodine, which is a, yeah. the crystal of iodine. It's heated up by a which is heated up. Uh, I, I, well, well, is that kind of it, light? Isn't it, no, <laughs> isn't it um, heated up by uh, an electric current? Current, and, and yeah. then so, yeah. it skips the and does that becoming also liquid, the light? and then it creates a gas. a gas. Oh, that's true. Yes. Yeah, so how does it? Does it create the red light? I, 
Mm. Because the gas isn't luminescent levels. in itself, is it? Yeah. We need to know this. No, but well, well, it's just the heating unit glows mm. red. That heats oh, the thing so, to its uh, okay, I sublimation so. point. Idea yeah. just happens to be an element that yeah. goes straight from solid to gas without going through a liquid. Mm. So it's a bit of a trick then. The red. Um, it's not the actual. Yeah, because a lot. No, because the iodine is is coloured purple. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the gas. Purple. Yeah, it's purple gas when it's. So the glass is clear, same as in cradle. Mm-hmm. So look, some people and and also in hyperstasis. So we've certainly had some visitors thinking, oh, that's brown glass or yellow glass or purple, and it's not, mm-hmm. and they've explained yes. that, no, actually that's what's in, it's clear glass with coloured mm-hmm. mat- you know, gas, gas or liquid or whatever yeah. in it, uh, ooh, and the fact that the new um, Jacob's Ladder substance sublimation unit is warm, and if you put mm. your hand nearer, you can feel the warmth from it as it goes up. The thing is, yeah. is it, it, we've got a barrier, we're safe. Even though um, we turn it on at the beginning of the day, um, it then has a life of its own and in yeah. functions. We, this is why I quite like, so Hearst's A Thousand Years, I thought was brilliant because it is a cow's head with flies and it is alive and it's doing something. Yeah, and you just sort of leave it thing. and it does it its, own its own thing. Cycle. And there's something, I, I, don't, I couldn't possibly describe why I find that yeah. joyous, but that's sort of what's going on in... There's in a process. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm. But I don't find that with the interestingly the Bergvall work. Him and him and Hamad did go to university together. Did they really? At the same time. So would you enjoy it in the same way if it was just dead in a field, not in a ah, gallery? Maybe. Context? Yeah. Actually, well, meaning as in really it didn't maybe. light up at all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the uh, so the, the, the decomposition. The, oh, the d- ah, that's very interesting. Yeah. So if it's like taken out of context, of a head in a box rotting away with flies. Yeah, I get you. That's a thing. So if, if it just came across one in a field somewhere, would it be interesting? <laughs> yes, I, it, yes, it would yeah, be. I have. Yeah. I have, and I would say, it, it's something that there is a sublime quality, but, and I am one. <laughs> I hate using the word sublime, considering with art because it's so loose, it's so woolly. But that is a truly sublime moment because um, that you're like c- contemplating death in front of you. Mm. And yeah, I think it is, it is a very powerful thing to, to show. But yeah. Hurst has edited that mm. experience and put it in a frame. Mm. And there are things that aren't in a thousand years that would be within the field like you're uh, in a field perhaps you're going to have smells yeah. um mm. the seasons Often and you're in a white field yeah absolutely or oh, yeah yeah the cold yeah. yeah very um and you're you're also in it because there'll be flies around you yeah. Yeah. whereas yeah. these flies are contained no i mean i'm interested i lived in africa for a while i've been walking mm. down a sort of gully at some and there was a dead eland big antelope and I could hear it before I could see it. Oh, oh really? Uh, just the wow. number of flies. They weren't yeah. about a ton. They're the biggest Kind of buzzing. Yeah. And I couldn't get past it. It was yeah. so cloying, the smell. I actually had to climb up and round it. Wow. Really? I just couldn't. I wasn't. It wasn't. It was gro- I was grossed out, bothered by it. You'd see dead antelope and so on quite regularly. But it's the this smell. It's just it? so overpowering. I'd, like, well, literally, my eyes were watering. Mm. And I just couldn't. Yeah. I was like, oh. And just could, I had to go up and take a detour mm. around it. I just couldn't yeah. get around it. The fact that I could see a cloud of, of insects, mm. and I could hear them, you know, it's just astonishing. It's and kind it was, of an experience, uh, and and that, yeah, that it was intensive. A, a time uh, that it's a kind of time-based experience, mm. isn't it? And maybe that's what you well, get. Well, I think I think you're right, Sarah, because it's also bringing what has or what is an experience to a gallery where perhaps more people can experience it, because not yeah. everybody is going to walk in a field uh, on one particular day mm. and experience this mm. cow rotting. Whereas in a gallery, it's now presented for, for people to experience yeah. and witness. Yeah. And an interesting thing about that is obviously, so while well, I'm writing a paper about Hearst at the moment, Blog. the difference, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> catch it when I never release <laughs> yeah. it ever. Um, the, the difference between his shark and the, so his shark is a rotting, well, it's not rotting, but it is a dead shark in a tank. The difference between that and a thousand years is that something is actually happening. Because a shark is in years. stasis, isn't it? Yeah, nothing mm. is happening to a shark. It's very still. But in a thousand years, something is actively decomposing. You have things just flying around. and. But it's new as well. There's always something new. I think I was yeah. saying that you've got life and death there. You've got flies yeah. dying in the... Uh, what would it be called where the flies die? It's that little like, fly catcher, isn't it? Oh, the, uh, they go up yeah, to the light the and they die. 
but yeah, the, I mean, yeah, I think in terms of yeah that change going up, and also the the chemical process, those are things that you never really see, which yeah. I think is very mm. intriguing. That's, yeah, that's but, but okay. with with uh, the other works, uh, Bergvall, uh, the kind of spoken word stuff, and the Walter van Rijn, I think although those they have those elements they have audio which is changing i think the but is so much more attractive because it's something you haven't seen with the bergvall and the van rijn you, you do hear a lot of audio every day you do it, it, it's not exactly mm. um a new experience you won't get anywhere else yeah although they have their own qualities mm. i think the thing with um water uh, sorry not water um the Hamid Butt uh, pieces is the ambition is just incredible. I think, and I mean, the 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 thing also is that the artist has um, his own context, and his he's he's got access to different things. Each artist has friends in different realms, as it were, and. And they draw upon these this, these things and this knowledge to uh, make their art. And I think um, Hamad Butt, because he um, comes from um, the bi uh, biochemistry background, he he knows that he has this understanding about this um, how to do this work, how to yeah. make it. But he still yeah. had to um, make the most amazing calculations that some of them are sort of presented in the in the case um, you get an, an idea of the equations and what have you he had to, to do but also he knows somebody who can make these glass vessels for I don't know anybody who could mm. make a glass vessel like that and, yeah, and 18 the myself. same you know mm. and I just think that these yeah. these things are important to the work as well mm. um, and that's one thing that I get from from there, that the, the expertise and just the the kind of serendipity of it, and also like the tension because, you know, of his illness and that the the kind of tragedy of it too, and I think those things all sort of um, feed into the work, yeah. and they are you can feel them. I, I there is it, it's well, when you look at it. There's Hamid Butt specifically. Yeah. There's a fragility that you don't get, May, especially the cradle more than anything else, because the other ones are like chunky metal bolted to the wall, yeah, or they're pillars that arc around themselves. Um, but with the cradle specifically, and like you say, with his illness that he had, there's a fragility that you get to see um, that we, we talk about life and death with the, the cow set and that with the cradle. You you want it to be in motion, mm. yes. Because yeah. you, you, when you think of a Newton's cradle, you imagine it knocking. Yeah, and it's the an transferable unusable model. Yeah. It's an unusable model of one, and it's li it's yeah. literally yeah. It's a waiting. model of that which it's, could kill yes. you. Yes, and it's yes. like oh my well, god, that's intense. It could make us have to close the building for eight hours and it'd yeah. be tiresome and yeah, smell yeah. bad. That's and I think <laughs> it's that that combination of fragility of the glass being so fragile enough because it's only scientific. It's the same, like the same as that you do on a test tube, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just blown in the university uh, science department. Yeah. So yeah. we, I mean, I don't know just. how much experience. I know. Found, I mean, you say that like that's something that happens. I, but know. it does. It's, it does. I'm, yes, I'm, in the I'm, certain field. If you work in, in that sort of field, can't have the glass blown in yeah. a university yeah. glass yeah. Yeah. lab. No. Just not like okay. that. It's not that unusual in that context. So yeah. he's part of the context for that because he's yeah. got that background to know the person. Mm. To do it, technically, obviously, you could go and look them up and find them, but yeah. maybe it wouldn't be forefront of your mind. Yeah. Where he presumably had seen, you know, various glass objects in labs and being a biochemist would have used many. Mm. Um, well, there, that's an example of something that a lot of artists did in the 90s is you take something, well, and just throughout art history, is that you take something alien to art, you take something. Um, that's outside the realm of art, such as these like scientific balls or well blown blown test tubes, and then you bring them in, mm. and that's suddenly like a piece of well, it's like a new thing for everybody. Mm. Um, 
and people are normally yeah this is cross-disciplinary um, thing but it seems to be a la mode now is uh, where artists work with scientists or with linguists or with um, yeah um, run out of ideas now <laughs> but, <laughs> you know whatever um, person in a different area of expertise residencies are very often in a university department or a, yeah. um, I th there's so, such a diverse range of places and contexts that you can do that so that the crossover of expertise and art uh, and the artist drawing on somebody else's knowledge of, and, and incorporating that into their own artwork is quite interesting collaborative sort of way of working I think. The thing I would also say is that the ideas take a precedent over the craft because you don't see the person who uh, blew the glass credited in the work. No. There's also there's an artist called Louis Kamnitzer who painted a grey wall um, uh, and also got a painter to paint a grey wall as well and they're both next to each other mm -hmm. and on there's a piece of paper stuck on each wall uh, and they both contain the prices that either the artist charges and the painter charges and the artist is allowed to charge let's say £10,000 while the painter can only charge his labour rate, which is like 200, and obviously we don't have that in um, uh, in the work downstairs, but I wonder if that would open up any... Well, somebody was saying, a visitor today, I think, about um, having other people make your art for you. Yes, <laughs> actually this has been yeah, a contested subject in the gallery. Yeah, mm -hmm. have you had some Well, with, with um, the tapestries mm. that were in the Gerhard Richter show, we had one gentleman who didn't want to consider them as a piece of artwork because they weren't made by Richter's hand, they were made by a machine. Um, and he said, oh, well, Grayson Perry makes his tapestries uh, by hand, to which I, I think I replied, no, I think they're done on, a, uh, yeah, they're they're done on an iPad. And I think he had a bit of a red, red pill moment. He wasn't. Um, I think it would be that for two, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> two or three they're years. They're also just trying to produce one. Now. I think it's the yeah. same process. Same, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much same. exactly. I think they're probably made in the same place. Yeah, they, I but, think they are. Yeah. But I think craftsmen are employed so, so that an idea can actually be... Realized. Yeah, be realised, yeah, yeah, because otherwise we, well, we wouldn't be able to do... Hasn't that been the case for centuries? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, not yeah, like yeah. painters school off and then the master comes in and does the tricky yeah. feat. Mm. Yeah, like, like, <laughs> yeah if, you see, if you see school of Titian yeah. on a painting, it's not Titian, no. it's his assistants because... And he's like looking at the shoulder going... <laughs> yeah, I, wonder, I wonder where that derives from, where... Do you think it's a childlike thing that either at school or we're praised for being individual... And, and oh, this need for something to yeah, be Yeah, because I, it, or it must be done by myself and it cannot be touched mm. by another um, and therefore it is valuable. I guess it's kind of a... Because that's not taught in school, is it? That, oh, actually, yeah. you can all do a piece no. of... No. But I guess, well, it's, I guess it's left over from this, like, the worship of the painter as the one who's skilled. And I guess most people... Most people <laughs> get into art and go far in art because they've been skilled at painting. And I think when you get to a stage where perhaps that's no longer required in certain forms of modern art, it's very frustrating. And mm. also for people who have made it so far and not had success or mm. a, a, a lot of a lot of things. Maybe it's a repeat of the primary. Yeah, necessary. because I think that's true <laughs> that <laughs> all the famous celebrated mm. artists now are not necessarily the most gifted in terms of skills and... <laughs> well, you mean sort of like manual dexterity <coughs> skills? Yeah. Because well, they I have mean, wonderful skills in concept. Or well, I, I yeah. don't know. It's quite interesting <laughs> that, because, it, <laughs> you know, the going back to do you have to be um, brilliant at drawing to be an artist? Mm. Um, and, and it's kind of uh, taking that a step yeah. further, isn't it, really? But I think lots of people who are not representational maybe were at one point. And we had a chat about this the other day. Yeah, we did. That lots of people can draw excellently, have excellent draftsperson yeah. skills, mm. but they stop doing it to mm. do something they find more interesting later. And of course, unless you dig into their prior work, you don't know that they can draw. All you know is that at the moment they're not drawing. Yeah. It's not the same thing. I think it depends on. I don't know. Is it, anyway. is it going to be <clears throat> useful um, in terms of the art that you're making? Um, yeah. Do you really need to. Like, uh, photography versus drawing. Um, 
if you want to produce something incredibly, I don't know, maybe surreal, um, would you lean towards photography or using drawing? Um, and certainly photography has its methods uh, regarding time and you're not going to be spending, I don't know, a year on a drawing versus something that you can set up with some lighting in a studio mm. and maybe some figures in the, in the perspective. Yeah, because I think we have, um, we have this notion that drawing and painting are the most skilled things we can do, and they are incredibly skilled. Mm. I, I would love to learn to actually paint very well at some point in my life. I just don't have <laughs> enough time to right now, but I think what you see where we have multidisciplinary art, where you are able to make anything, it's not that skill has disappeared, but it's that people are... People become extremely skilled producers and there are different levels of skill so you could be a very skilled drawer or painter but equally you could be an extremely skilled producer of videos or producer of mixed media or yeah. producer of a ranger of objects for an yeah. installation mm -hmm. and it's a skill because they're, they're not just dumped in a room that somebody spends a lot of time arranging yeah I feel almost now um, today that you're less skilled if you can't manage a let's say a, a group of skills if, if, yeah. if you just draw it's almost like you're limited with that whereas someone who uh, is installation based and makes work from various elements yeah it kind can, of can like do sort of more or is less inhibited mm. by well, they're inhibited by their resources yeah at that point, cause most you know most artists don't all people who are making art as local artists don't have access to a space big enough to do no, installation art, mm. even if they've got that the ideas true. to do it. Mm. Um, so what they do is what they can, which is to mm. draw or paint, or make very small sculptures, mm. or whatever yeah. it is they do. I, think, uh, I guess video as well. I think, yeah, we do kind of sacrifice the mastery of one, uh, one medium like painting or drawing to become like a jack of all trades. Mm. But w at mm. the moment, we seem to kind of enjoy this Jack of all trades thing. Yeah, where someone you, where becomes, you're good at Photoshop, you're good at drawing, you're good at such and such and such, like a master of a lot of different. Yeah. You become a master a of being a jack of all trades. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's <what> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I, love that. I think he is a multidisciplinary mm. artist. I guess that's what Richter was doing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's very prevalent in artists today. Jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I said that. That's that was Piers uh, yeah. who said that. Trademark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can haggle over the rights to it. <laughs> yeah. Listen back to the Where do I take that degree? Masters yeah. in Jack of All Trades. <laughs> Masters in <laughs> MA in Jack of All Trades. Thank you. But no, you see it in art schools today. I certainly, when I was studying, um, uh, we there was a great um, dislike of somebody attempting to be a master in one particular discipline. Mm. Um, perhaps some people were more quiet about it. Uh, but if if you if your intention was I will be as good as Rembrandt um, in this art school. Uh, you were sort of dismissed because there were schools that were dedicated to technical training, whereas in a fine art school, you were using it, various elements. It's and it wasn't yeah. cross disciplinary. A absolutely. And if yeah. you're not you're cross disciplinary, there then you don't fit in. Yeah. Yeah, which is. A shame. But I suppose if you sign up to a course, the remit of which is mm. to to be cross disciplinary, then you kind of are going yeah, to be expected to do so. Yeah, that's true. Uh, to mm. read the blurb before you take the well, start I of the degree, maybe. Well, I signed up to fine art painting, yeah. and I did do painting, but I was quite often encouraged to do my installation work and my sculpture work, and and sometimes quite heavily criticised for the painting, which I think that's a real shame. Yeah, that, I think that, that's that does a very happen. Big shame yeah, because um, I yeah. mean, I still, I still sort of do move around and I enjoy that actually and one feeds into the other and I'm glad that mm. I didn't just stick rigidly to painting yeah. and I was encouraged to and uh, at foundation I did definitely explore lots of different um, media but yeah I did yeah. end up sort of it within I think, um, I think our outlook shouldn't be oh she's a painter we need to get her to do such and such and such mm. although it has been quite successful in your case, but I definitely knew people at my uni that were really disheartened by um, just the course being very unaccepting. 
yeah, of painting and I think instead of having that right we need to make them do this this and this they need to do something more cross discipline yeah. I think we need to say like no let's if you're going to do painting let's make you the best painter you can possibly be yeah, yeah, perhaps it was detrimental to say to a student oh well you paint but it's it's high time to change and perhaps mm. instead of because this was sort of applied generally in, in the art school that I went to um, that we should all uh, practice in a variety of mediums um, but maybe you have to be more specific when it comes to someone who is intent on painting I mean, yeah. I I wonder if that and applied just painting from, knowledge too I wonder if that just comes about from the teachers not actually yeah. being the thing is painters. also painting maybe, there's yes. many different Washington. types of painting anyway of course. And my, I'm, yeah when there's I kind of enough about, in that discipline when right? I talk about painting myself I was semi abstract abstract painting I wasn't painting I have a, a colleague that has that paints um almost photorealist Chuck you know, and his his style mm. of painting is totally different to mine I wouldn't be able to paint like him mm. and um, I don't actually you know that's not what interests me but um, yeah it's it's interesting to think about I'm sure people come into the gallery and do expect to see paintings mm. and quite often they do say oh it's yeah. not my cup of tea and um, I do like the city art gallery and I like to see traditional paintings. And, but I think it's great that they have the opportunity to come here and yeah. experience... Well, the fact that you can do both easily yes. on the same day. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> very true, because we're yeah, only... Yeah, yeah. Very lucky. And I have been yeah. surprised, I have to say, by some of the comments of people it, who, who have actually... In, enjoyed the experience, who have taken something from the experience, yeah. who have appreciated the experience, and yeah. maybe not necessarily appreciated all the artworks. Some of them have said it's things like it's weird or... <laughs> <laughs> where does the gallery start? <laughs> that was one gentleman's yeah. Wow, where do you think it starts? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's just out in Guildhall Square. I thought it was, was, a, thought it was a big <laughs> industrial department store. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think coming into... Um, this gallery more so than City Art Gallery because it is a bit more traditional. Um, you're, you're, are you, you expect you're, you're open to more different things that you wouldn't expect, mm. I guess. But well, going it's the contemporary art gallery, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so, but itself. I guess that's related to what you're saying about people, at least more so from your or, or, uh, experiences with universities and things like that, where you're encouraged to be more multimedia. It, do you think, in some way, that that is because it's so it's becoming more a saturated environment where people only do one thing it's more competition if you like mm. so that they encourage you to be a bit more diverse so you can come at it from different angles that sort of thing i don't because mm. i think to some degree <clears throat> the arts is a very it's words it is very competitive yeah i think at times from an educational standpoint mm. as well and everyone comes in a lot of the time, I, I mean, at least for me uh, uh, doing photography, that a lot of the time you do share um, specific styles, certain themes especially, uh, that you want to tackle. So then to some degree, coming at it from a different angle, if you incorporate writing or drawings in your work, that can separate you a little bit more. But And I, I do mm. find that teachers do actually prefer that. Depends what your aim is as well, because they're, they're, some people will be sort of um, solipsistic in terms of uh, art education and um, just stick to a, in a corner and do printing. Um, but they may be intending to present work at print shows only and mm. aren't bothered with installation or um, or other, other sort yeah. of uh, ways can, of presenting. And can be incredibly yeah. more successful. And they, yeah, they may be, okay, I want that. to be... Uh, presenting work in the mall galleries in London because I am a draftsman um, while other people and looking say, more towards a commercial yeah um, maybe mm. or that they, they just want to be a printmaker yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think another thing is that the art world seems so uh, impenetrable in terms of how do you how do you become a success how does your work become valued who mm -hmm. do you go to that perhaps it's kind of like oh we'll just just try everything, just do a bit of everything. See what because you enjoy. You become very diluted, I think, if, if... Well, perhaps if it's positive, then you come out of art school uh, 
although we are all very well it, it, I guess you're young I anyway yet to meet you, many yeah, positive it, regardless, yeah, <laughs> yeah, regardless of your age you are young um, coming out of a BA um, you've still got so much more to learn um, mm. and yeah, whether, yeah. whether you immediately go on to do a masters and have uh, an issue you feel needs to be resolved um, and it can be resolved through uh, further study on a master's. Um, but yeah, do people really know I this is the work? There's two different sides to this. There's, I, looking back, the John Hansard Gallery is predominantly uh, known for conceptual art, mm. and it is sort of a pioneer in that area. And the, mm. the works that we see are, you know, conceptual work. Mm. Actually, you know, I, I think conceptual art most art is conceptual in mm. a way. Yeah, in terms, in the sense that it needs a concept to be made. <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's just, it's like, you know, the work that I made, painting, sculpture, there was concepts behind it. And I think more of myself now as conceptual artist rather than a painter or a sculptor yeah. or an installer. That, that word guess, seems to embody... I guess the difference is, is that conceptual art... Uh, for the most part, relies on the idea, mm. not yeah. necessarily the, the work in front of you being the best crafted thing, thing in the world. So then you've got this kind of divide then between that sort of... Um, but then that, I, I think they both come together. That's, yeah. that's the other... The successful they conceptual do. art does both. Yeah. And less successful conceptual art perhaps has a drop-off in craftsmanship, so... Hannah Butt is very well crafted, mm. um, but perhaps there are other um, conceptual works of art that are less. But couldn't well you take crafted. it to the extreme and just present a text that says, "Well, this is my idea," and explain it? Because because then you have it's an ex- happened. Yeah, because yeah, then you get the extreme happened. of like Yoko Ono's. This is a painting. You say, "Okay." Yeah, or like the white there it is. the white series. Yeah, um, all those. All the performance well, like Robert Robert stuff. Yeah. I think there are Rauschenberg's the white paintings. It's just yes. a series of blank white yes. canvases. And then there's um, the de Kooning rubbed out and all yeah, these yeah, sorts yeah. of yeah. the raised drawing. But why yeah. not present just the idea? Um, well, this is something. Well, but then again, it's presented as a piece of text. The lights going on and off in the gallery. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all the yeah. I think I think I think it goes back to that. It's not satisfying mm. in terms of we generally go to visual art to look at something it's something visual yeah but yeah. that's something else that um, you mentioned David when we were talking about it the idea of novelty mm. and how to some degree when you come in and you see something that's new and interesting and different yeah. that adds a certain degree of oh I, I quite like that but yeah, is it because it's novel and it's yeah. Yeah. you're not used to it in a way that's, a, that's how a lot of art history has taken place especially modern art in terms of well it hasn't been done before and that's why it's so the white paintings by Rauschenberg oh well nobody's done this nobody's made us think of the canvas as an object or perhaps as a or <laughs> been like what are they and, yeah. Yeah. and um, me and Dave were talking about this earlier with the uh, John Latham's mm. to some extent um, yeah. Just kind of playing because John Latham has these canvas events. Could you? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> for those who haven't been here yet, many listeners, um, they I won't go to the whole backstory of the landscape, but they're based on a particular landscape, sort of a post-industrial landscape. And he's part of this. He's produced a number of canvases are unprimed, so there's no like <clears throat> coating on them. Any paint you put on will soak through to the back and so on. And they're very rough, they're unframed, they fray, they, they're kind of battened very roughly to the wall, clearly on purpose. You know, they're not in formal frames and glass covered. And they're made by basically spraying red paint onto glass and then printing it onto canvas. And they're almost entirely abstracted, mm. I suppose, torso, maybe yeah. mm-hmm. only partly. But um, And there's some which are twisted canvases with red paint sort yeah. of in the twisted part. And of the time, because John Latham was, he was yeah. kind of one of the first people to be a conceptual yeah. artist or... I mean, it's part of why I like them, um, right. is, again, what we were saying earlier, like Poznanitska, because the context is part of when they were done, and others had not done this, and that interests me. I like them because you can also see images in them and cloud bust them, if you like, and I, mm. I kind of enjoy that. 
in yeah. some contemporary work. Not all day, every day. Sometimes I want to go and see her. Is that because you can have a bit more fun with it? Than yeah, and I like the idea that the artist has played. Yeah, um, and um, With a starting point, we were saying, yeah. you know, just like uh, Walter Van Ryan with his archive, and then you've got John Latham with that. I mean, that's a body of work with a starting point. Mm. And um, he has taken that and interpreted, or, or experimented, played mm. around with some some different techniques and yeah. ideas and mm. I think it's quite interesting we've had quite a few students from Solent University this week coming in and for them I think this exhibition has been brilliant um, sort of uh, quick five minutes um, guide to conceptual yeah. art sort of thing <laughs> well you like know. you're saying with um, sort of having that central beginning point and then having the extra bits around it with students coming in, they know that they have this central idea. And I think this is what uh, Walter does in the sense that he has this archive. The computer is essentially the, like the, I don't know what to call it, but like the, the mothership of the whole work. Yeah. yeah, that's the main body of it. Yeah. But then the other aspects around it are sort of other means of visualizing that mm. one concept. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, I guess in terms of people coming in, the uh, new to conceptual yeah. art. Yeah, and he's done. The, he's got the font as well, which is a yeah. slight uh, diversion from. Although obviously he's fascinated by language and um, and talking about language, there's uh, Caroline Bergvall's work there, which is um, that's an. Uh, we haven't really talked about that, have we? But it's um, quite an interesting piece of work because mm. it's um, dealing with language and she spent a lot of time in the, I think, was it the English Literature Department at the, at University, the University of Southampton. Of yeah. Southampton. Mm -hmm. So there again, she was really sort of embedded in an environment where language is really the, the key. Um, mm. to, and she also is a trilingual of um, English, French, Norwegian. And she has presented this work um, as text on the wall in a very bright day glow orange, orange <laughs> which people <laughs> wince when they see yeah. it's quite difficult Especially to read bright day, yeah. where, where it's so bright kind of on, on sale orange Yeah. Mm. and then the, the trick kind of, you know, the trick it's not fair to call it that really but the it's quite a hoops. clever concept of putting, <laughs> the, taking the O's out of the, the, the text and putting them on the windows and then to take that one step further yeah. that when you go outside of the gallery, sit on a bench in the Guildhall Square and look back up at the space you just left, you can see the O's that... The alignment of well, that's quite the letters coming together. Yes. Well. I tell people may go into that uh, gallery yes. and not receive anything from it and I'll, I'll go in and say, oh, did you know that the O's on the window uh, relate to the the orange O outside on that bench, and they go, oh, really? And they go out. And, and then they go out yeah. and they do it, and but then they, really engage, then they disappear. They like and that, don't they? And that's kind of the, talking about the experience mm. thing and actually experiencing an artwork. That's kind of what they mm. But that's also weird. Enjoy, We're here as well, so we do affect people's experience. Some people will come in and... They won't and After no. they've heard or had a conversation with one of us, their opinions or just their experience within the gallery has yeah. totally changed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with, with that whole novelty thing of, okay, we go out and we look at the O's and they line up, mm -hmm. I think um, back to the question on novelty is, is, is novelty a valuable feature? Because even though we go out and we're... I, I guess it's kind of a valuable feature in terms of it makes people uh, pay attention and go, oh, what's that, and, and interact. But um, it always leaves me thinking why mm. well why why are the o's on the window what what's the reason for it i don't yeah that's true I, I haven't heard any sort of elucidation on that about bergfell's work why why are the o's missing yes yeah, so because because i'm like, trying to analyze it and i'm like well but why i mean like okay it's cool the o's are missing but why mm. i'm sure there is a reason i, I i'm sure in uh some of her works inside books there are letters missing um, right. and there must be reasons for that but yet yeah, to employ a novelty does bring attention to the work 
But if you if you cannot yeah. read beyond the novelty, then it remains as a novelty mm. and wears. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know the reason for having the vanishing point out in Guildhall Square other than it's a pleasing thing to do. Mm. Yeah. It's a nice geometric idea. It's sort of like painting with invisible straight mm. lines. I like it. Um, the room itself is hard to look at because of the colour chosen. That is a conscious choice by the artist. Um, the erasure of the O's. Hmm. Is it about silencing voices? I think it is. If you I read think the text, it might be. Uh, um, yeah. It's like not you know she has a voice. Not everybody does. Hmm. Um, so she's erasing part of it. Why the O's and not the E's? Let's say maybe it's yeah, simple. Maybe it's just you've got to choose about, something, and it's a nice shape yeah. and it's complete hmm. and it's a circle. Uh, may, maybe it's simply that. I do not know. She's repeating the script which is on the walls. The poem, which you're saying is from Cropper? It is Cropper, yeah. And what What is Cropper? Um, simply a poem. <laughs> what it's, is just an, it's just the title of it. Um, okay. So, I mean, it's, it's included in Medal English, which is a larger collection of experimental and concrete and minimalist uh, poems and is well worth a perusal if such things float your boat. Um, mm. But yeah, um, as, as we were sort of hinting at there, it's not the only thing in the room and there is a sound uh, or an audio a- aspect to it, which certainly for me washes over me a little bit mm, if I'm yeah, in there. I know yeah. it's there, um, I have to remember to listen to it. Yeah, I'd um, agree. Yeah, I find it almost like either white noise or slightly well, just being gallery assistants, mm. we're in there, <laughs> and this stuff becomes migraine inducing because you got <laughs> you you go in there and Caroline is reciting her poem, and then Walter Van Ryn is spewing whatever he is about his statistics in the other room. So you're in between these two Somebody just did long say to me, <laughs> like noise pieces. The, the fact that that's it, that's in a foreign language and you don't understand it is is difficult as well. Both mm. of them are, aren't they? Because Walters mm. is in uh, his native language, yes. as is Caroline's, and as native English it's speakers. It's a bit of an assault on your senses. Make generally. English great again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it it is difficult. Um, the, the, I I suppose it's a, almost like a music going. Yes, but. I, I don't know. I well, if you don't know the language, it purely just becomes sound, as yes. does writing. If you don't know uh, how to read French, it is just symbols on a page. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just becomes you know, a scenic. If you don't know it at all, a scenic, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly One it. thing it's I thought we could yeah. mention, actually, sorry to move on, but just as I know we're running out of time, um, I was just thinking about the stair slide space. On an um, audio note. Yes. 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 Um, yes. An audio. Yeah. So note. associate artists, stair slide space. They are back again, um, and they've got something called invisible tour in the gallery. And what that does, similar to what time after time does, where it bridges the two spaces together, they've recorded descriptions or. Is com- are, com- are they conversations as well, or is it just descriptions of previous shows? Uh, I think a bit of a mixture. Did anyone here do them? I did, actually, yeah, I did yes. One. You did? And you did one. Uh, yes, yeah, participated a in a, a um, recording, so. yeah, a recording. It's basically an interview. Yeah. Was it at the old gallery space? No, it was... Um, the old during here. Sampler? Yeah, ju- yeah uh, no, they were done during Richter, near the end, okay. um, asking people... Um, sometimes staff who happened to be in or whoever was willing to do it really mm. who'd been to the old Hansard to just reflect on previous shows previous that right? works that they remembered clearly so you oh, you did have to remember them yeah 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 uh, so yeah it couldn't be what you'd read something like yeah I went to that exhibition mm. and boom that so oh, the, one really stuck with me so they've taken these um, interviews and made um, almost like poetry from it I think haven't mm. they and they've got two people reciting the words and sometimes it, it does sound quite poetic um, and the the name of the piece is um, Invisible Tour yeah. um, I think there's a little slight problem I've experienced is that people think that it's a tour of the current exhibition yeah. Yeah, and that's what that's what I've taken up against it as well is that yeah. you, it could be anywhere but where we're there, we can help to explain yeah. like what it is a little and bit. And I think once people know that it's not actually part of time after time, then they are free to... They can wander around the gallery if they mm. want to, because there are actually uh, segments of text which are part of those interviews uh, actually put on the wall with vinyl. So you go around and you see... 
think there's one by Gallery th- Three Door. Yeah, it talks about a lemon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think that adds to the the fun aspect of it, where you can, if it's even if you're not playful, actually yeah. taking the tour, you're walking around and seeing the text. You don't actually know you're on it. But then you do it's a treasure hunt because yeah. I keep I found a new one found a new one today. Oh, oh really? Yes. There was one in the locker, yeah, that, and then yeah. one in the kitchen. Yeah, that's where... the one I found. I haven't been in the kitchen ah, since. okay. Uh, I, I can't I can't remember what the one in the kitchen says now. It's related to water, isn't it? Mm. I had to walk a hundred yards like with that. a cup of water or something yeah. like that. But, and is... there's a text version of the interviews as well, so it's all anonymised. Yes. And then there's a text version down mm. in the foyer with yeah. various materials. Yeah. And you do actually get access to the recordings on the SoundCloud that this will be on. Right, oh, as well. Yeah, so you can, yeah, so you can access the recordings oh, away from the gallery. But yeah. It's far more enjoyable when you're here. Yes, absolutely. I would say. But um, no, I think we've, we've tackled many people today <laughs> and many topics. Well done, guys. Um, well, thank you. But I, I think, yeah, that'll wrap up episode two. Uh, once again, you'll find us on social media on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook if you search John Hansard Gallery you'll find us all uh, and if you do enough digging I'm sure you'll find all of us as well mm. <laughs> come and see the show on come and see the show 3rd of November 3rd of November, Third of November. Mm. and then Edward Woodman 19th of November photography can't wait oh, I'm excited Yay. very exciting so geek. But yes yeah. thank you everyone all right. and thank you. we'll see you on the next episode thank you okay. Bye. Bye. thanks